Welcome, boys and girls, cats and dogs. We are an inclusive channel around here. Today we welcome John Fidel Rosales, who is also known as Mr. Crafty Pants and also has a YouTube channel called Boys Don't Knit. There is a separate YouTube channel called Mr. Crafty Pants, which is not John. Um, yeah. So, um, um, although he looks, you know, pretty interesting too. <laughs> but, um, so tell us about yourself. Well, um, like you've already said, my name is John. I have a variety of things that I like to do as far as with the fiber arts. So I like to knit. I like to crochet. I like to spin my own yarn sometimes. I like to embroider. I like to sew. Um, I've dabbled in needle felting and weaving, but those are things that I'm still super novice at, and I would really like to get more into those when I have the time for. Uh, weaving takes quite an amount of time to get set up, and in fact, I think you can kind of see my my little loom behind me, which has all my sewing projects stacked on top of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I think it still has cool. a project from about like five years ago still on it um, that my local weaving guild help set up on it but um yeah pretty much that's what i like to do on my off time i'm also a nursing student i work as a nursing um uh, a nurse's aide uh in california we're called certified nursing assistants and i'm working to get my license uh my license for vocational nursing so become an lvn my sister was a nurse for many, many years, and I have myself been hospitalized and really appreciate nurses tremendously. They have um, a huge amount of admiration from me. And I understand that in California, nurses um, starting out RNs, they can do pretty well. Yeah, yeah, they can. And it's, um, uh, I will be coming an LVN first, which is kind of like a step down from an RN. Um, there's like, you know, a few different differences. Um, and then I will eventually get my RN, hopefully. Um, they do, yeah, I, I hear that they do make pretty good money, but California is a very expensive place to live. So, <laughs> of course, yeah, that's it. Even where I'm from, I'm from uh, Fresno, California. And, uh, this is one of the few places during the pandemic where uh, rent has rised sharply. So, um, I mean, really? compared to like San Francisco, obviously, where uh, $2,000 gets you like a really a shoebox. small studio. Yeah, <laughs> with barely any heating. Um, but uh, it's it still has uh, risen quite substantially here in Fresno. That's so, interesting because yeah. I've read that a, a lot of the larger in a lot of the larger cities, um, the rents have gone down because people are moving away, or they yeah. have been, and uh, landlords are desperate to get people. But it, apparently, Fresno is one of those places that people are moving to. Yes, so, exactly. Um, We're right between San Francisco and L.A., and a lot of people from San Francisco and L.A. are from Fresno. So, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of cousins in both of those cities, um, and a lot of people are moving back here to Fresno, or they are gonna they work remotely from Fresno since it was right in between. Yeah, so, actually, and, I think one of my New York City friends was from Fresno, and he he moved back there before the pandemic, which I think was fortunate for him. Um, in terms of financial uh, uh, stability, but, um, oh, I miss him. I need to reach out. Anyway, mm -hmm. so let's talk more about yarn and the stuff that you do. Um, I've seen some really great pictures on your Instagram. Uh, as usual, I, um, I found you on Instagram. I find a lot of the people that I talk to for this series on Instagram because... There are so many guys out there who do amazing work. Yeah, I um, that's kind of has been an outlet for me. I think when Instagram first came out, I remember thinking to myself, like, oh, do I really want to get on it? Do I really? I don't really like posting pictures of myself. Like, and then that's when I started making it more of an outlet outlet for like my knitting, my crochet. And I think a lot of pictures of my cats. Um, <laughs> I and, did uh, see the, the cat pics. <laughs> and babies, I was yeah. tempted to make Mrs. Slocum jokes, but I won't. 
Um, <laughs> you get what I'm saying there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I've been knitting for, I think, since 2010. I started when I was working at Michael's. Um, I was living in Los Angeles and I was a digital animator. And when I moved back to Fresno, uh, recession after the recession i was trying to find jobs like you know they had to do anything with my skills and i wasn't finding anything here in fresno and so i thought oh well i'll hold the job at michael's arts and crafts for a while and while i was over there um i got no questions about the fine arts section or pencils or inks or anything else i knew about i was constantly getting questions about knitting and I thought these crazy people coming in, asking all these questions about yarn, dye lots, knitting needle sizes. I mean, what does it matter if it's like bulky or thin yarn? Can't they just grab a pair of needles and just like knit with it? So eventually I learned to knit and I found out that I am one of those crazy people. And I understand now <laughs> the big deal. And I look back at, wow, you know, all these poor, you know, retail workers who have no idea, you know, what they're stepping into when they go into that yarn aisle. Um, and yeah, ever since then, I've been a huge avid knitter. I think there was a few spaces of time where I didn't knit for a while. Um, one of the recent times I could think of I didn't knit for a while was at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think with being in the nursing field and everything, I was so burnt out from life and the pandemic and the hours that I just didn't knit for about a year. And I've heard a lot of stories about healthcare workers getting burnt out and, um, and just the emotional drain um, that, that the pandemic has had on them. I mean, it's a very draining job anyway. It takes a very strong person to do it. Yeah. I yeah. think. It was, it was very challenging um, seeing the results and everything. And I would come home and for a while I had all of my project bags right next to the door. So this way, whatever project I wanted to do, I could just grab it, you know, on the way out. And I was taking my project bags, but I was never working on them at work. I was just so burnt out. And when I would come home, I wouldn't do anything. And I think I got like the biggest, bulkiest yarn you can imagine and the biggest hook I could find. And I just made like a crocheted um, a scarf and it was a real quick project and it kind of jump started my crochet and I kind of jump started my knitting and that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Now I was watching some of your early YouTube videos and when you back, you said that um, the first ones you were still working at Michael's, and you were saying that you picked it up um, when you were trying to quit smoking. And although you didn't quit smoking at that time, when you eventually did quit, the knitting was a tremendous help for you. Yeah. I, um, my coworker who was always crocheting things, uh, she told me that... Um, she heard that knitting and crochet could help her, um, could help people quit smoking. So I thought, okay, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And so I, I tried doing that. And like, like you said, uh, there were times where I would drop a stitch and I want a cigarette so bad, but you know, finally when I got to that place to where I could quit smoking, it, it was a huge, huge help. And, you know, kind of fill that empty space of being to fidget with my hands or go somewhere and do something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I quit smoking about eight years ago because I, I quit smoking right as I met my current boyfriend. So we've been together for about eight years. So oh, that's a good long time. Yeah, and yeah. and that's a good long time to to stay stopped because you know, as any anybody with any experience in um, addiction or compulsive behavior knows, it's easy to stop. But then what do you put in the place of what you're taking away? Mm -hmm. Knitting and chocolate. So, <laughs> Well, I used to be an OA, so chocolate wasn't quite an option for me. Um, but, um, but yeah, you have to um, 
people don't always um, think about it in those terms, but it's true. Um, you have to find something constructive. And, I mean, I could go on, off on a tangent about this all day long, so, um, but let's get back to the yarn. Mm -hmm. So, um, I see that's a really nice hat that you're wearing. Did you make that? Of course you did. Oh, yeah. This is a hat that I knit myself. I won't take it off because uh, I didn't... And I went a little crazy this morning and uh, just grabbed whatever hat that I could find. And actually, it matches my shirt today. But um, it is a hat that I knit with a design, um, a knitting pattern that I found off of Ravelry. And this is made from hand spun. So um, I think I knitted this from a... What's that? Um I'm trying to think of the the yarn company. They're from South America. Um, Do you mean Barocco? B e r o c c o. I don't think they're no. South American, though. No, they're Italian. Um, see, I I I don't have the budget for posh yarns. <laughs> I have a taste for them now, but I don't have the budget for them. Yeah, this is the uh, this yarn. Um, I really like them a lot. Um, I'll have to I'll have to put it in the show notes or um, get back to you on it. But they're a pretty budget yarn. They're really nice. The only issues with them is they have a, a color lot issue. So even if you have the same color lots, you when you're knitting with them you and you're starting to run out of one ball, you kind of mm -hmm. have to slowly start introducing every other row, the new ball because of the color matching issues. And yeah. with their... They're, um, they sell roving so you can spin from, and the only issue I have with them with that is uh, it's a little bit felted. So, which, um, if you know, it makes it a little bit harder to, you know, tear the fiber apart and spin it into yarn. So, but uh, it came out really beautiful. I like it. It kind of reminds me of, I don't know why, the planet Mars. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's some red in there, so I can yeah. see that. Yeah, I like the colors. I really do. Um, so is that one of your favorite brands? Um, it, it used to be as far as with, uh, it's kind of what everyone kind of first starts off with when it comes to spinning, because they're kind of like a budget fiber. Um, but I would say my favorite brand as far as to spin with, with roving, would have to be... Um, her, you find her on Etsy and online if you type in created by LCB. So created by LCB, and she has the most extraordinary, beautiful colors and that you'll ever see. And um, actually, I brought some yarn out. Uh, so, for instance, like this. Oh, that's kind of beautiful. Creates yarn that looks like this. I love that, and um, that the that colorway. Are are you familiar with Crystal Bagoday? Um, with who? Crystal Bagoday crochets. Um, uh -huh. uh, anyway, she's she's a very popular crochet channel, but that that colorway would be so totally up her street. Yeah, I um, like you know more vibrant colors myself, but I really think that that the one you showed just just now was beautiful. Yeah, she has really beautiful um, uh, colorways. This one is called Indian Paintbrush. So it has I can like see that, orange. yeah. It has these light greens. Um, it has a little bit of red in it. So it's it's beautiful. I, I love her work. And uh, she makes such beautiful colorways to work from. So And her fibers are just... It's like spitting with butter. It's so beautiful in between your hands. and <laughs> It's like butter. <laughs> yeah. That's cute. So, so how long have you been spinning then? I have been spinning now for um, I want to say about six years. Um, oh. At our county fair, um, our local f uh, spinning and weaving guild. So the spinners and weavers are together, and they have a guild here in Fresno. And um, they had a booth at the county fair in the Home Arts Building. And I don't know why I was looking at um, 
I was looking for videos on knitting techniques and on um, speckled yarn. What is that stuff called? Um, when it has like the little speckled tweet. I was looking up a oh um, tweeted I yarn. I tweet love tweeted yarn. Yeah, and I came across a video of um, the somebody spinning some tweed yarn and showing the technique they used to make tweed yarn. And I was like, wow, there's spinning. Like, what is this? And I kind of, I kind of was in my back of my head. Like, that's something I want to learn. And when I went to the county fair, there was a, a lady who's now a friend, Martha. Um, she was spinning, doing a drop spindle. And I said, oh, that's <laughs> something I would like to do. And she was like, well, then get back over here. Let's teach you how to spin. And within about 15 minutes, she showed me how to spin yarn on a drop spindle. So, oh, that is so cool. Yeah. I wouldn't mind learning. Um, I, I sort of find the idea intimidating, actually, because it looks hard. But um, if you're saying in 15 minutes you could pick it up, I don't know. I picked it up. I didn't pick it up well. <laughs> well, anything takes spindle, practice. But, I dropped it yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you die as well? Um, I have died before. It's not something I currently have the setup for. I live in an apartment and kind of in a drought here in California. So <laughs> no, so, uh, um, but no, I don't, I don't really have the setup or the space for it right now. I do a little mm -hmm. bit of fiber processing. Um, I've done it. And in fact, I have like about six bags of fleeces um, at my parents' house that I need to go through and actually like wash and process. Um, but no, I've done, yeah, like I said, I think we have a, a, my friend, she has a die day for anybody who wants to come. So essentially she puts down a date. She says, anybody who wants to come, you know, you pay this amount. She brings out all of her dies and she puts out the setup and you bring the yarn or the fiber or the threads. If you want to embroider with hand dyed stuff and you dye all you want. And she shows you how to do it real quick and you just go at it. I would love that. I have some hand spun yarn that somebody gave me that I have been afraid to touch because I want to dye it. I don't even need for it to be fancy. I'm fine with a solid color, but I'm afraid I will ruin it. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's why you always bring a little bit of a, that's why you always practice on like Michael's, you know, um, uh, try to think what that what their 100% wool's called. Um, I haven't knitted with Michael's yarn in forever, so I can't remember any of the brands anymore, but they have like a 100% wool yarn that if you ever want to practice starting to dye with, that's a really good, you know, practice yarn. It's not people cute, also, it's a little bit scratchy, but not too yeah, much. Yeah, people also suggest like going to a thrift shop and picking up a 100% uh, a wool um, sweater and practice dying it, uh, dying with that. Either you just frog the whole sweater, or you dye it as uh, complete. Yeah, that also that also um, helps too. And it's, um, I mean, you, you won't ruin it. I mean, the only thing I could imagine is possibly felting a little bit, but it's it's no different than when you're hand washing wool. So when you're dyeing it, you kind of just dunk it. You kind of more place the dye where you want it to, and. And you don't worry too much about trying to move it and agitate it too much. So, yeah, yeah. And she does the know, technique too. So, oh, yes. I've I've seen that. I've seen a number of um, yarn dyeing videos. Actually, there are a bunch out there, and so it's really just a matter of you know growing a pair and doing it. <laughs> but. Um, that's with anything, though. <laughs> That's I mean, true. Like, yeah, because my, my recent thing with knitting, though, is um, pretty much doing techniques I've never done before. So if it the pattern has to have something that I've never done before in order for me to work on it. So because I told myself eventually one day I would like to start to mm -hmm. do my own patterns and do more like uh, creativity with the knitting patterns that I'm getting but I need to kind of build up my skill of knowledge. So it's all about. That was actually going to be my next question is whether you do your own designs and write patterns. 
No, the, I, I'm more right now at the point to where I feel more comfortable just adjusting patterns, maybe combining patterns together um, uh, more so than writing my own patterns. Like I think I've done Honestly, that. that's how I got started is, is with a pattern uh, that somebody else created um, and I just made so many changes to it that by the, by the time I was done, it was more my changes than the original pattern and then I thought, I'm a designer now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a pattern writer. <laughs> <laughs> and a mathematician, because I feel like sometimes you're having to work out, especially if you're doing color work, like how many repeats you need to take in and out with the with the corresponding circumference of a hat. So yeah, I've done that well, before. I've added, um, uh, I think I got for free some yarn from uh, my local... Um, I didn't like the original you know, Fair Isle pattern that was on there. So I just took a Halloween, like, kind of panel that had, like, pumpkins and pitchforks and all kinds of things, and I just, like, uh, switched them around. So this way, now it has a Halloween pattern on top of it. Sort of a Fair Isle style with Halloween um, images. Yeah. And so it kind of had actually work that sounds now. pretty cool, even though I'm not crazy about Halloween. That does sound cool. <laughs> I would love to see that with like Christmas images, oh, you, yeah, you that'd know, be fun. the holly and the berries and that sort of thing, and the and, um, and the trees, all of, all all of those old pagan things that that we associate with Christmas. Yeah, and that's kind of like the interesting part is when you start mixing the math into it because you have how many stitches goes around. You have to kind of work out, well, if you're putting this new, if you're adjusting these patterns or combining them, and especially if it has color work, you kind of have to muddle some things around with the pattern so this way everything fits appropriately. That's one of many reasons I, I say that knitting is a mystery to me, and I'm okay leaving it that way. Because I can, I can cope with crochet. I can do manual color work. I can do. Um, I I really like self striping yarns for certain projects, and I I like variegated. I like solids. But you know the manual color work I can do if I have to, um, including uh, like working in uh, colors for specific designs, um, like you see. Um, Graph gams. In fact, I wish I had it at hand. I got a pattern. I downloaded a pattern. I never do other people's patterns anymore because I get bored. Um, I get bored with my own patterns if I'm, <laughs> you know, if I'm done with it because I, I want to do something new. But um, there, were, apparently, in some popular TV show, there is a phrase, "You, David." So of course, when I saw that on a big blanket i had to download the pattern i don't know the tv show but it sounds uh, like uh schitt's creek i think people have mentioned that so i i don't watch tv i watch youtube i'm all about the <laughs> i'm all about the yarn and the jane austen so um I would yeah. highly suggest watching Schitt's Creek just because I find uh, the characters to be really inspirational. And same thing, like I've always joked around, uh, me and my boyfriend, we were talking about the one of the main characters on there, Moira. She's this very poshy woman and she has this gigantic wig collection. And so throughout the show, you're constantly seeing her switching wigs and she has a room with just wigs. And I think there was like a fire scare at some point <clears throat> in the show and she was making the husband collect up the wigs <clears throat> so my boyfriend would joke around saying that's me with my yarn <laughs> yeah. i feel like i wouldn't be conservative exactly. I'm like, Get my yarn out of here you know <laughs> and i thought about that no i okay yeah would i would have to go yarn? with the <laughs> yeah the synthetic stuff first because that stuff's gonna melt you know the the wool stuff <laughs> that might last that might resist the fire a little longer but the right? the um <laughs> You know, for so long, I was all about the budget yarns, including the ones that I say, you know, give acrylic a bad name. Um, and so I, I have a lot of those still in my stash, but I don't like them anymore. I want posh yarns. <laughs> I want the budget for posh yarns, and I don't have that yet. But <laughs> I like really nice yarn. 
Yeah, I am. I'm very much about, you know, the posh yarns. Like I think one of my favorite projects, <laughs> it was like 30 something dollars a skein. I bought it at this little shop near a, a Tascadero here in California. But when I was uh, telling you about that project that um, jump started my knitting again with the crochet, it was that crocheted scarf um, that was made with some kind of budget yarn, I guess. The It was a huge chevron scarf. It has super huge stitches in it. And this was uh, Karen Cakes. It was their sprinkle yarn. It's like a... Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, did you do I, manual color control on the yeah. rows? So what I did was I got the ball and I got my... Uh, ball winder and i just manually separated the colors i know a lot of people who do that i can't be bothered i'm too lazy it was fun uh but the only thing was i noticed that even with the same um i now i know that with that i don't know if it's the same with all of the the caring cakes but i know that with the sprinkle one specifically <clears throat> they uh the colors weren't matching. So I kind of had to play, you know, with the colors. Really? Everywhere. Yeah. Because the assumption is that with the cheaper yarns, they don't have dye lots because they're almost always a hundred percent consistent. Yeah. Um, I mean, they might not be fun to wear or to work with, but they're almost always really consistent. Um, so that surprises me about, about the Karen cakes. Um, I haven't used a Karen cake in a long time, but I am overly fond of Lion Brand Mandala cakes. Oh. Um, yeah, my uh, my friend Jeannie, she, um, uh, she crochets a lot with those. And like I said, I'm very much about the, the big budget yarns, but the Mandala ones, they, I'm trying to think of which one it was recently that she was knitting with it was one that had almost like an ass acid wash like characteristic to it and it looked so beautiful and the colors that they picked out like i feel like a lot of the big budget of yarns are picking out these more like very now color ways yeah well they're always introducing new colors so that they can like you know make sales really yeah. <laughs> um but um you know, this is a recent thing that I finished with a a, um, a self striping oh, lion brand mandala, and um, you know, this is a pattern that I am. I have it in testing now. It'll be unraveling soon, but um, um, I mean, it works. The self striping cakes work really well for me with the kind of things that I do. Because uh, I'm too lazy to do the manual color control, as I've said. But um, where was I going with that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure it was going to be something self-aggrandizing. Because um, <laughs> that's who I am. <laughs> but um, You'll remember at 1 a.m. in the morning in the shower, probably. <laughs> no, I'll probably remember just after, just after we say goodbye. That's when I'll remember. Uh, but... Um, uh, yeah, um, a lot of the self-striping cakes really work well. But also, um, I got this particular colorway in a, a it was a, a Lion Brand mystery box. I got three cakes of the same colorway. Oh, the colorway is fairy, by the way. <laughs> they knew you. No. <laughs> <gasps> Whatever are you suggesting by that? Anyway, yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, there's another one that I've used a lot called Valkyrie. They know I'm an opera queen, too. But, um, um, uh, but yeah, it's um, the, the three cakes that came were, you know, pretty consistent with the colors. So I, when I use those particular colors, I'm not worried about about consistency but you're saying that some of the other kinds of cakes out there uh, some of the other self-striping e budget yarns are less consistent yeah i haven't worked around with uh i don't know if it was just the specific um you know lot and that colorway or if it's kind of across and then again they must not run into the issue of people manually separating the colors 
to put them together. But yeah, I was having to come, I was comparing, you know, I put all the plums together. I put all the grays together, all the violets together. And I noticed that there was a huge difference within the colors, even though they were wow. not. So I bought three of them, made sure that they were, I made sure that the dye lots were all matching. Um, and yeah, they were completely different. So I actually, to, I, I think there are a lot of people who do that, who separate out the colors from self-striping yarns to do manual color control. Um, I, I know that there are people who watch me who do because we talk about it sometimes. But um, it's interesting I, um, that kind of variation. I would I would love it if anybody is is watching now who has that sort of thing to to report, please make a comment. Make a comment anyway, because I need comments and support and everything like that. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, so you were talking about some 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 recent projects and things that you've accomplished. Yeah, I um, like I said, it was um, mostly just trying to find things that I have never done before so i always look for either a texture or a technique so um i'll bring two of them out uh this one right here is a very simple um stockinette stitch shawl oh wait no this one is the try and think of the technique um i should have wrote this down before um but i don't know if you can kind of see that technique of um how the stitches are looking it looks it, a little bit herringbone-ish herringbone yeah that's what it is yeah okay um, yeah because there's tooth. <laughs> yeah no there, there's actually a crochet equivalent of, of herringbone too yeah um, and i, 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 I like the before. colors of that yeah this is using um uh noro yarn so this is silk wool and i think it's mostly just silk and wool Mm. So I really love the way that the silk kind of shines because, um, you know, silk and wool, they take up dye so differently. So you get these really interesting, you know, color combinations. And um, and I really like the way this is. It's a cowl, kind of goes over the neck. It's supposed to be going over the shoulders, but my shoulders are a bit broad. So uh, mostly just kind of lays decoratively across. But I've never done herringbone before, and that was a lot of fun. It was a little bit tough on my knuckles. Um, with uh, really thick knitting needles. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it was a lot of fun, and I like how it makes a thicker fabric, almost like crochet. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah sometimes when I'm doing something that's new, like if I'm using a smaller needle or hook that I'm accustomed to, um, actually, and earlier today, I was like, I was using a ball winder with the manual crank. And it had been a while since I, I had done that, and I'm going, my shoulder's getting tired. When is this thing going to be done? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I persevered. <laughs> but, you know. Um, Winding colors for me is always an event because um, I have one cat, the black cat, and she knows, like, immediately as soon as I bring out the ball winder and I bring out my... Um, uh, the little skein holder and everything she knows i'm going to be winding balls and so i kind of have to keep an eye out and make sure she doesn't she she has this tendency she just wants to jump right in the middle in the in the winding process and start just like rolling around and everything so yeah. that could complicate things couldn't it yeah yeah uh -huh. the cats have the cats have a, a taste for expensive yarn too they like to uh -huh. chew through anything that's 100 percent wool or anything that has any sort of wool or animal fiber in it. The acrylic stuff, they leave alone. But the <clears> wool, they love it. So I actually have to keep everything in plastic uh, bags, in airtight containers. Yeah. yeah, I can't leave anything out or just hanging around. So <laughs> Our dog likes to come in here. Uh, this, is, this is where I do almost all of my work, sitting in this chair. But he will come in here. Usually he's just looking for food, though. Um, <laughs> he might smell some food trash in the in the garbage can or there might be a crumb under the chair or something but he'll find it by I golly <laughs> those dogs um, they will <laughs> um but you know he'll come in here 
And there have been times when he's come in here and gotten tangled up either with the yarn or with the cords. I live uh, in fear of him pulling my laptop off the table. Ugh. <laughs> when I'm, that's why I close the door whenever I'm not in here. But, yeah. but we just got him oh, maybe two months ago. He's a senior, and we rescued him. We got him from a rescue organization. Oh. So he has these big brown eyes that you cannot imagine. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, yeah. he is. Yeah. He's on my Instagram if you want to see him. But, um, yeah. Um, so let's talk about social media. Um, um, I mean, we've talked about your Instagram and your YouTube. Um, what else? Uh, well, tell us about those first and then other things that you do. Well, uh, as you know, I'm Mr. Crafty Pants on Instagram, and um, I'm probably going to keep it Mr. Crafty Pants on Instagram, just because that's my gamer handle, too, also. So everything across, you know, my gaming platforms, I'm Mr. Crafty Pants. Um, but I know there is another uh, Mr. Crafty Pants out there. He seems like a really interesting guy. He does a lot more sewing and quilting related um, content. Um, and I get tagged every once in a while as him. Like I'll have all these people like saying, Oh, thank you for the suggestion. And I'm like, I've never met these people before. And it, and I think it's because there is a period difference between our names. So he has a period. Oh, his okay. mister, and then I don't. Um, uh, but, um, I probably won't be going across that on, um, any of my, further crafty content uh, mr crafty pants uh it'll just be that on instagram and all my gaming tags um and then as far as uh with my youtube channel i have not made a video since before i became a nursing assistant i think i stopped making videos because it got so crazy with nursing assistant and it's like a three-month program like nonstop, five days a week, um, going to clinicals, you know, going to the labs and everything. And then I didn't make anything afterwards because I was so busy with work. You know, I hadn't worked full time in like over a decade. Um, cause retail, it's terrible. They don't, they don't pay you enough. They don't give you enough hours. And then suddenly being doing full time, you know, CNA work, that was really intimidating and a lot for me. So I didn't make videos again and kept on like coming up with things recently. I kind of set up my computer. Um, I think the only thing I've been really waiting for was just kind of getting this room cleaned up a little bit in the background. <laughs> but, Nobody cares. Uh, hope, Look at the mess behind me. <laughs> you just but, make um, excuses and just make a video I know it's, <laughs> but you know what it's always going to be there um, yeah. whenever you're ready um, I hope you will make more videos um, I want to watch more of your early ones where you were talking about uh, learning to knit and the accomplishments that you had way back uh, this was what six seven years ago um, so that was always that, those were interesting watch oh thank you yeah uh, i am i look at those first early i mean i'm i don't know if you go through the same issue where you like you look at your first few videos and you watch in horror like i was like wow i had a really hard time talking in front of the camera <laughs> lots of i know and exactly and... what you mean yeah um, and yeah. i used to go through and edit a lot of them out but you know now it's like okay you know, uh, you just gotta do like Arnie and Carlos, what they do now. They have like, I forgot, there's like a whole word they have for it now where you don't do any editing, it's just straight one shot, you know. So that's what I do with most of these conversations, unless there's something that I really need to take out. I'll just, I'll just put them on, I'll slap on a, a an intro and an outro. I was telling you that before we, I clicked record, and then, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll you know shove in a few pictures that you send me and that sort of thing put your links in the in the description and we're done yeah. so and i love doing these these uh conversations and actually i'm finding that i get really good response and i think it's one of my strengths on as a youtuber to do these um 
but I'm talking too much about myself. Stop me when I do that. <laughs> I can't. It's like, I'm so good. Well, you know, part of my job as a nursing assistant too is not only talking to the people, but also listening. So I love listening to people. I mean, I mean, that's part of the reason why I love like, you know, listening to podcast. Um, yeah. But, uh, as far as with, uh, again, with social media goes, um, that's, and I, and I do hopefully one day when we get past this pandemic, you know, craziness and everything. Um, right before the pandemic hit, I was already making a list of uh, events that happened in California, like um, Lambtown, uh, you know, our local county fairs, everything like that. And I was planning on doing more on the location shoots. I was even uh, starting to take classes with our um, public access television here in Fresno to start cool, being able cool. to take out equipment and, you know, do more of that type of thing. So hopefully in the future, um, I will be doing more of that. And I will probably be uh, changing uh, the, the YouTube channel a little bit too, because when I first started, it, it was more of a focus on men's knitting and men's uh, patterns. But I feel like I want to change the focus of my channel. So you'll probably see a different name in the future and then a uh, different type of content than what was typically on there. Yeah. Now, what, from what I know of you, and we've only recently met, it seems like the that kind of vlogging content that you're, you're describing, I think that you could do that really well. I don't, that's not something that I do necessarily with, you know, going out and talking about my day, but I think that you could do it very well because i think you have that kind of personality oh thank you <laughs> yeah no like i said a lot of it is um uh you know something that developed while at my current job you know having to listen to people having to talk with people having to pry out information from people um you know it's uh it's something it's a skill that I've kind of i felt like i've really been developing and i felt like oh that would be great if i could go on to do some more on the scene location shoots with all of the things that happen locally here in California. So, and we do have quite a bit going on as far as, you know, before the, the pandemic had hit with Vogue knitting and stitches. Well, I don't know if Vogue knitting does anything here in California. I know there's stitches West. Um, like I said, I know there, there was about like four or five different um, things that happened in California alone. I figured after my first year after California, maybe branch out and start, taking some trips, going to other places. Cause I know there's a few things that happen up in Washington too, as well. Now there are some regional knitting or rather now they call them fiber retreats that I think you would be interested in. And they're still going on, you know, of course you have to show your vaccination status and, and also do a, a COVID test either the moment you get there or show one that is less than uh, 72 hours old. Um, but um, having, having done that, I, I, a few weeks ago, I went to one in New York and I'm going to another one in, in North Carolina in November. Um, so um, I think that you would enjoy those things too. Yeah. I know there's, there's one in Washington, there's one in Palm Springs. But I think that one's already sold out. Um, there's one in Colorado. There's one planned for next year in Ohio. And of course, the one there are two every year in upstate New York. The spring one sells out within minutes of it going public. I mean, people wow. wait by their computers to, you know, click order, you know. <laughs> Well, I'm very familiar with that. I have a, what was it? I, I proved to be pretty fast. There was a, there was a event coming up for a video game that I'm into and video game stuff really does inspire me a lot. I, I feel like a lot of my really? inspiration comes from video games, horror movies, and sci-fi. Um, that's where I know you look at my work. You probably don't think, Oh, that's like, you know, sci-fi and horror, but I would, I would be fascinated to, <laughs> to know how that, that, um, that, turns into inspiration because because those are three things that are pretty foreign to me really <laughs> um and you know that's okay but i wanted I, I, the inspiration process is fascinating to me um well as far as with um i would say with with horror 
a lot of it has to do and sci-fi um the, the the ones that inspire me more is kind of like in the future with sci-fi when you look at like fashion you know things like movies like aeon flux and um trying to think of other futuristic almost somewhat apop- apocalyptic you know that color schemes the uh, that tend to go with it kind of people just going back to basics or even just the futuristic colors kind of just get me in the mood to create and make things like I see stuff, amazing things that characters are wearing. that's supposed to be in the future, whether it's in a very developed or post-apocalyptic just gets me in the mood to just start making things and making clothing or sewing or doing things like that. Um, Horror movies. um, I feel like, they've been getting very stylized lately and just seeing the colors and everything inspires me, makes me look up similar colors online to go pick up things um, to uh, as far as colorways go. And uh, with video games recently, um, a show like, no, um, the game that I'm playing is called League of Legends. And they have characters from this made up place that come from different regions, very different styles of clothing, different creeds, um and emblems that represent the regions and that's been making me want to start designing my own uh embroidery logos to put on clothing uh that represent the different characters oh. that i like to play as that's cool yeah that's so. cool now uh there was a time probably before you were born when um a lot of horror movies were had this like really really gothic overwrought uh, feel and they were set in the 19th century where of course the ladies would wear the um the the crochet or knit shawls and and other garments and things in fact let me see if i have it right here uh, i i have a book somewhere there it is called ostentatious crochet which is all about creating new um crochet patterns inspired by jane austen and i'm passionate about jane austen um which which is why um we have let us say different entertainment tastes but um <laughs> so so do you find that sort of thing in um um uh, the period stuff inspiring uh, yeah, I do. Like, I have um, uh, one of the characters that I play in the League of Legends. Um, she, uh, this game is is so ridiculous. The characters, like, you start talking about them, and they're they're just nuts. And this one character that, when I found out she was being made, I so I have to learn how to play this character. She is her the way to describe her. Her name is Gwen. She used to be a doll. And she took part of the soul of her maker and the tools that her maker used because her, her, her maker was a seamstress. So her weapons are a needle and thread, a giant needle and thread and a giant pair of scissors. And she's very Lolita looking. And uh, there's just something very inspirational about that character. And I, you know, I think I was even not only playing her as a character more, but also it was making me want to knit and crochet and, you know, get back into spinning. Now, I have a friend who has a crochet channel and a gaming channel and does both of them almost daily. And he showed me a game that was all about yarn. Um, I'm not about video games at all (laughs) because I'm an old guy. But um, that looked sort of entertaining. So um, have you seen that sort of thing? And does that interest you? Uh, yeah, I've actually been meaning to get that game. Um, it's been already a couple of years already because these games, when they first come out, they're like fifty-six dollars, if not more. Um, not only that, but like they usually have add-on content that is, you know, pretty costly too. And if you wait about two or three years after they get released, they get released for like twenty dollars as a bundle with everything that came out online. So I think it's about time I invested in that. But I'm really interested in games like that too, where you see kind of how they mix between crafts and the art and seeing how they, how they mix together. I think there is even little big planet, which is a very crafty looking game. And it's kind of interesting to see how they interpret art and, and, and yarn. 
you know, yeah, the crown exactly. Yeah, I lived for 14 years with a, an Apple employee, so I learned the folly of being a first adopter. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you just wait, you know. It'll mm -hmm. come down in price, <laughs> and there will be something else that all the first adopters want more, so you can get this one at a good price. But um, but that's yeah, you know, it's that way with everything, everything that's uh, that uh, uh, every consumer good, I guess, really. So um, that's interesting. Oh, oh, I was going to follow up with another question. Uh, the Gothic question, the gaming question. Um, well, what kind of things do you have on your plate? What is what do you see in the next few months in terms of crafting? Um, like I said, I would really like to. I do have to finish some last year. No, right before the pandemic hit, I was making some Christmas stockings for friends, which were um, Christmas stockings. But instead of it being a foot, it was a cat's paw. <laughs> uh, so I have a few friends that love cats that I was making those for. My um, sister would I love to that. finish about three of those. But this year, there are about three different nurses that I would like to do embroidered Christmas stockings for. So um, one of them, it's going to be a cat pattern that I've already made. Um, the Another one, I'm thinking it might be a Star Wars pattern that I might have to make myself. Make myself too as well. And that one's going to be a... Um, uh, because she's a nurse and uh, she's really help me out as far as on my journey it's becoming an lvn i wanted to make it look like a um uh an anatomy book picture of a heart so she's kind of into the horror a little oh, bit too. that's cool yeah so whenever we talk about movies and uh and she always looking for good like horror suggestions i always give it to her like you know as far as like uh, movies that i'm currently watching um, so I wanted to make a Christmas stocking for her that looks like an anatomy book picture, but have the heart embroidered. So I'll probably be looking for mm. trying to figure out some sort of background fabric that looks like text and then try to figure out how to make that heart stand out on top of it, whether I want it to be black and white or if whether or not I want to incorporate, you know, the the artery usually look the art the, there's the ventricle part and the arterial part and normally the arterial part is represented as red the ventral part is mm -hmm. blue, so kind of figure out art wise because that's one of the classes i'm taking currently is uh terminology mm -hmm. and i was taking anatomy and physiology so i was as i'm going through these you know anatomy books i'm really interested in the artwork that's in them and that's, that's kind cool. of inspiring actually do you know i knew somebody who had retired from being a chiropractor who started studying um drawing and illustration um and very well could have gone into that kind of illustration field now the the what you were talking about with the heart reminds me of you know i've done tons of church music in all different sorts of churches so i'm thinking of the the traditional um, um, sacred heart picture where Jesus is like holding out his heart for you, literally, <laughs> which is sort of grisly when you think about it. But I mean, that could be a very creative uh, craft <laughs> project. Well, a lot of that Catholic art kind of is. I mean, that's, a, that's another thing that inspires me too, is looking at, you know, a lot of that type of art. Like, um, uh, have you ever been to the Vatican? No. I, I have, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but there's a, there's this, um, this, I remember seeing a door and right above the door is this weird sculpture of a man in the bed, but there's like a skeleton coming out from underneath the bed. And I, I can't remember exactly. I'll have to look it up and send you the picture. But it's a very creepy, disturbing <laughs> door just to see, like, what is this even supposed to And represent? there's That's your inspiration right yeah. there. Why is it in the Vatican? It's like this weird, it's this guy in a oh. bed 
and, and I, I a skeleton yeah, coming out of it. So from all reports, the art treasures that the Vatican has are just beyond measure. Yeah. I would love to see some of those. I mean, I'm, you know, I spent a lot of years in the Anglo Catholic Church, High Episcopal Church, so I'm not a terribly big fan of the RCs, but um, I recognize the, uh, I recognize a lot of the work that the nuns do, for one thing, but also, uh, and I do have a lot of atheist friends who would gladly throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and I'm not <laughs> like that at all. At, but at the same time, I know that the art treasures, um, it's, it, would be, it would be bigger than King Tut's tomb if, 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 if those could go on exhibit. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, the, they do. If you were to ever could take a trip there, that should be on your bucket list. It's so beautiful, that place. And like I've said, actually it, never been to Italy at all. It yeah. is on my bucket list. And it's it's so beautiful what you'll see in the streets, but especially like it, like I told you in the Vatican. I think the only upsetting thing you'll see over there is they have these beautiful statues that are you know so old and so amazingly done. The, the anatomy is so accurate. You could just imagine it just to start to breathe. Uh, the only upsetting thing I think I saw while I was over there was all the genitals were knocked off of the statues. So I guess there's some sort of joke that there's <laughs> there's a box somewhere in the Vatican with a bunch of marble genitals in it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just really awesome. And yet, and yet David stands <laughs> intact. But um, and, and, and it's interesting. A lot of those sculptures that we only see pictures of, um, I have read from reports that that people say you know up close they're not that impressive you have to be at a distance to really perceive them correctly and that is part of the genius of the artist you know yeah and i think it's it's also um has to do with maybe it also might be different for myself and maybe for yourself too as well as fellow artists you know it's kind of like i think the way people see knitting and embroidery um and crochet and all these different artworks like they have an appreciation for them but they don't really understand the amount of work that went into it um and see the beauty in it quite like we do as fellow fiber artists and um that's kind of how i see like the the statues in a bit and what i love about the artwork at the and catholic artwork and the tapestries and everything you see over there is um I feel like you can't really ever see someone's faith. You know, you can't really believe in somebody else's faith. You can't see how much they they love God or have faith. But when you see that religious artwork, you can see someone's faith for a moment. You can get someone's appreciation for, you know, their love of God or their 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 belief system. You know, that has always been my 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 uh, point about religious music because you know I. I studied music, and um, I have done a ton of church music. And if you look at things like you know, the Bach B minor or St. Matthew Passion or um, even the Verdi Requiem, you know, you, the Brahms Requiem, all of those things, you know their faith. And you know, you know, Do you know what? It doesn't even matter what their personal faith was, but they were so miraculously skilled at getting that across in the music. Yeah. And, you know, it's true in, in you know, the visual arts. I don't have the knowledge in visual arts that I do with music, but I can still see a lot of that stuff and since we um are crafters um you know you have your own areas of expertise i have mine i also have the um the music stuff we're able to while 
appreciating it aesthetically, we can also see it on an analytical level and see how it works and how it conveys um, the creator's intent. Creator with a little C and a big C, if you like. And that's the, yeah, that's part of the reason why I love social media as far as Instagram goes. Instagram a little bit more than Facebook, um, uh, but even with Facebook, like the, the Facebook groups that I'm part of, um, which are mostly my highlight of, of looking at Facebook, um, I love seeing other people's work. I love seeing other people's interpretation. You know, you can get, and even when you go on Ravelry and you go on the projects part of a pattern, same pattern but seeing people's different interpretations of it is mm -hmm, amazing, mm -hmm. you know. I have not used Ravelry for social purposes as I am beginning to learn that I should. Um, I mean, I see that people are using my own patterns and posting their pictures to their pages, so I should be looking at their their pictures. Um, but also, I mean, there are groups within Ravelry, social groups, mm -hmm. that I don't know about, that I should learn about, you know, that sort of thing. But um, if we're, where were we now? Uh, back to the social media stuff. And there are so many different ways to do social media, and you know, we all find what works for us. No, no. I mean, do you do things like TikTok or... Um... No, that hasn't really um, uh, caught on with me yet. Uh, my exposure to TikTok is at the end of the night, you know, before me and my boyfriend go to sleep, like, he'll tell me, okay, these are the videos I saw. So he get, shows me all the videos that <laughs> he knows that I'll like, and then he'll show me all of them. So I just, I don't even have to get on TikTok. I just, like, at the end of the night, I get there into bed. Um, and he'll just show me all the videos I need to see. But that's pretty much my main exposure to TikTok and when people send me stuff that they think I would, yeah, I would yeah. enjoy seeing. But You know, it, it seems like all of the social media outlets are blending together nowadays. Um, there's no escaping TikTok if you look at YouTube on your phone, for example. And TikTok shorts and YouTube shorts are the becoming blended, that sort of thing. I will lie in bed in the middle of the night when I should be sleeping, but I can't. And I'll be watching, uh, I'll be on YouTube, but I'll get distracted by all of the shorts, most of which have their origin in TikTok. Yeah. I, um, yeah, with the, and also like, I get a lot of them from, most of the time I only share TikTok things through Instagram and Facebook. <clears throat> and it's usually stuff that I relate to. So like stuff that's either nursing related or crafty related. And I share it with all my crafty friends. So we're, we might be in some of the same Facebook groups. Um, I hope you'll join my Facebook group, your darn dudes. Um, um, but uh, you know, there are several men's um, um, yarn community groups. There are even bear yarn community <laughs> groups, and um, I'm not sure that that is your thing, but still, they're there. Um, there's one uh, for bearded bakers. You know, it's 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 funny stuff. Um, and honestly, the rest of Facebook just infuriates me most of the time. So, yeah, it can be. It's that's that is one of those things where it's like. You know, I, I try to limit the amount of time I'm, I'm on there. Thank God for the unfollow button because you don't have to unfriend anybody. You just have to unfollow them. <laughs> but yeah, no, I know. Exactly, uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, it's just one of those things like where I feel like Instagram inspires me, Ravelry inspires me, uh, Facebook, the groups inspire me, but every, most of the other content other than, you know, my my friends who post, you know, funny horror and goth and anti-capitalist memes. Other than that, it just, <laughs> it gets very like, you know, discouraging, you know, in my wow. faith and humanity and all kinds of things. So I try to, I mostly oh, try yeah. to focus on just, you know, people who I know I'm close with and, um, and just the craft groups. Like I have a, um, some hand embroidery ones and the, I felt like the embroidery, 
groups that I'm a part of on Facebook have made me look differently at the type of groups that I'm involved with because the current ones that I'm always getting feedback on is my modern embroidery one. And I forgot what the other one is, but essentially it's an all out goes with your embroidery, whatever uh, subject you want to cover in it. That's up to you and your interpretation of it. So there are people who post stuff with like their expressions of genitals, of sex, of whatever life issues are going through. And that's okay because that's their embroider interpretation. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're getting, they're expressing themselves and, there are people who are saying, well, shouldn't the moderators be moderating this? And the moderators go at them. They're just like, you need to moderate your life. If you don't, you know what the rules are here. If you don't want to be a part of this and you don't appreciate their work that they're producing, then you, de you need to get off of this group or just get off of Facebook, <laughs> which I thought uh, was pretty know, interesting. <laughs> there are lots of rather naughty um, knit and crochet garments and other objects that you can find on some of those Facebook groups. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I've made one or two of those myself, but never posted pictures. But I just thought they were cute. Yeah, no, um, I think there was a, I think there was a Fair Isle pattern that has uh, male genitals on it, but it's done in such a cute, charming way that like, oh, I that. oh send stuff. me that picture if you can find it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a Fair Isle pattern. It's for socks, but I thought, you know what? This would make a really cute, charming cardigan, and I would totally love <laughs> to wear it on a <laughs> night out. <laughs> It would there be a was, really big icebreaker, you know, when yeah, you meet people, you know. Some time ago, there was a picture <laughs> that was floating around of, like, this full body suit for a man that mm, <laughs> included everything. I think I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. It was the anatomically correct, you know, body yeah, suit. Yeah, and there was a, an actual man modeling it. <laughs> so um yeah that 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 um i haven't seen it since i'm not really interested in making it i might be interested in meeting that man though but <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think is so interesting about like the LGBT community <clears throat> and the fiber arts and knitting and crochet and embroidery and how we all mix together and how we how we express ourselves through these arts. I think it's so interesting. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video on the people who knitted a garment made from human hair. I have not seen that video, but I've heard about it being done. Yeah, it was, I think it was, it's been so long. So I don't want to say what, what I, what, you know, what they say in there. It's kind of for what I remember. I think it was some women who were dissecting the idea of what it is to say that something is gay. This is, you know, when, you know, the, the, the slang gay was being, you know, mostly used for a negative aspect and mm -hmm. their dissection of, well, what is it to call something gay? Does it need to be? Uh, you know, something that would be found in the gay community? Does it need to be two men kissing? Does it need to be two women like in an action? To call something that's inanimate gay, does it have to have qualities of being gay? Does it need to be made from something that is from a gay person? And that's when they got the idea to get all of this hair from gay people, spin it into something, spin it into yarn, and then crochet a cardigan out of it. So wow, make this cardigan gay. <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm just thinking that uh, at the tremendous variety of hair types and colors you would get if you did that kind of project. Yeah, because it's just like wondering about the texture too. Because you know, as a fiber artist, I know that like part of what you know gives it that luxurious feel sometimes or even just the warmth of it and keeps it light and airy and lofty is the little curls inside of the animal fiber and you know we have very thick hair it's not very fine like animal fiber and i think well I remember even mine's somebody not really it. thick anymore but um <laughs> i heard it's <laughs> thick here and you know here but um not yeah. on top. <laughs> um, I think I heard someone say, like, when they put on the cardigan, like, it's really heavy. And I just, oh, I can't imagine. <laughs> He's not heavy. He's my brother. Anyway. Um, 
That's funny. That's funny. Oh my goodness, we've been talking for over an hour. It doesn't seem like it, does it? <laughs> no, wow. It doesn't. Wow. So, uh, we should probably call it a day pretty soon, though. What would you like to, to tell uh, everybody? Um, about yourself, about your craft, um, how to find you, anything you want to conclude with? Well, you can find me. Um, you can find me on Instagram as Mr. Crafty Pants. Um, that is, I don't know if it'll show my name at the bottom. Um, it does show your name here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I wrote down uh, pretty much my my handle for Instagram, which is Mr. Crafty Pants. Um, if you're on League of Legends, you can find me on Mr. Crafty Pants on there. You can add me. Um, also on YouTube, you can find me. You can find my videos as Boys Don't Knit. Um, that might be changing in the future, but probably not anytime soon. So, and my videos are pretty old right now. And if I post any videos soon, I'll probably do it underneath the boys don't knit handle or title. Okay. So I, I had your YouTube channel up a second or uh, uh, an hour or two ago. So I'm, because it, it, uh, it has your real name on it too. Doesn't oh yeah. It? I think, I think the channel is uh, John Fidel crafts. That's exactly what I was looking for. John Fidel yes. Crafts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And uh, your your real name is John Fidel uh, Rosales. Um, yes. And, um, and it has been a tremendous pleasure having you here. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Well, it's been um, wonderful talking with you. Exactly. Well, I hope so. I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad... Um, um, uh, to know that you enjoyed it. And I want to thank everybody who has watched us through the whole thing um, because that's what we're here for is for our viewers. And as always, you know, like, subscribe, comment, share, all the standard YouTube crap, and keep coming back. Uh,